Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Just continue to keep uh, Sandra and Nancy and Kyle, um, church brother, in your hearts and pray for them as we go through this. You know, as a pastor, this is the most difficult time for us, and I'm not trying to say I'm anything, but when we've got to go and meet with family, and we've got to do memorial services for them, I can't tell you how that breaks us up. After all these years of ministry, we've never got used to that. I don't want to get used to that. Because as the families, and as your hearts break, our heart breaks as well. And so pray for them today. And I just thank God. I remember just sitting there a moment ago, the one Sunday we'd asked Chad and Sandra to come and give a testimony. I remember them standing up here. He came up with his walking stick like this. And uh, he talked of his time in the Navy. Go Navy. <laughs> there's an, for those who don't know, there's an Air Force officer here in our midst, but go Navy. <laughs> so he came and talked about his time on the Abraham Lincoln. He was one of the flight deck personnel who used to ensure that the planes got off the deck and came back. And I just was so, uh, you see, you needed us even, Matt get off the ground. <laughs> so I was just thinking about that and just thought, what an amazing man of God. And as Gabby said, he was always joyful. He was always had a, something nice to say to me every time he saw me. And I just am so grateful for that. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Chronicles 12 and verse 32. As we continue in our series on decisions and destiny, and I want to talk to you about the sons of Issachar. You can't help but notice, both here in the United States and around the world, that there is a rising distrust and contention and polarization. It's just not on the national uh, or world stage. It also has taken root in our communities and our neighborhoods, unfortunately. This insidious spirit has been at work to ruin relationships, spark anger, create situations that foster chaos and division. And by the way, this church is a testimony to exactly the opposite. I mean, just look around. See the nations that are represented here. Martin Luther King Jr. said this. He said, Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the Christian church. And that was years and years ago, and unfortunately, it is still true today. We've become much more integrated in schools and military and businesses, but in places of worship, segregation is still the norm. And it's for, it's critical for us to recognize that the spirit is from the enemy. Jesus spoke of the dangers of division in Matthew 12, verse 25. He says, knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. Now I want to just pull out just a little bit about that. Think about the divisions, not only in individual churches, but think about the division between churches. They were critical of this person or that church or whatever. And you know, we must jealously guard against the enemy trying to create division. The bottom line of maintaining biblical unity is that we must be more concerned about others than ourselves. Matthew 23 and 11, Jesus said, The greatest among you shall be your servant. And so as a church, as an individual group of people, let us continue to demonstrate to the world out there 
that we're all equal at the foot of the cross. We have a choice. Either be bitter, resentful, contentious Christians, or be the servant of all who grows daily in the things of Christ. What we become will shape and affect the life of the church. And so 1 Chronicles chapter 12, 32 says, The sons of Issachar, men who had understanding the times to know what Israel ought to do. Let me explain briefly why I'm using this scripture. It's for two reasons. It relates to just what I've said. We need to understand the times we're living in. Charles Spurgeon, who used to preach to 10,000 people every Sunday at the Met. Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, he used to say, you've got to have a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. In other words, know what's going on around the world as a believer. As believers, we don't put our heads, bury our heads in the sand, but know what's going on in the world. And you as a believer, you stand in the gap for the nations and for individuals. And so secondly, why I'm using the scripture, it sets the stage for what we will be examining today and next week. And so on to the teaching, by giving you some background to this particular scripture. This is a crucial time in Israel's history when 11 of the tribes were without a leader, without guidance, without a model to follow. It's a time that real discernment and understanding is needed. And I want to tell you, we need it in this nation today, don't we? It's often during these crucial transition times where there is a lot of noise and a lack of leadership that results in rash decisions. It's a time when we require as a nation and as a people, we require people of real strength and character. For the first seven and a half years of David's reign, he was only king over one tribe. And after the death of King Saul's son, Ishibosheth, the mighty men from all the tri tribes came to Hebron, determined to make David king over all of Israel. One Chronicles lists them, sometimes mentioning their bravery. But when it speaks of the, mess, the men of Issachar, it draws special attention to them and says, they were men who understood the times and knew what Israel ought to do. As we look at the world and the church in particular, we need to understand the times we're living in. Not only physically what's going on, but spiritually, more importantly, spiritually as well. The very first disclaimer I want to make this morning is that I'm not here to bash anyone or compare myself to anyone. Don't hear that this morning from me in any way, shape, or form. I need to start this way because so much of the topic of the Holy Spirit is confused and lacks a depth of understanding. When we're not grounded in the Word of God and not disciplined with regular time with God, we are vulnerable to all types of weird notions. The result is people are carried away with every wind of doctrine, and there's always been a silent divorce in the church between the Spirit and the Word of God. You may ask, what's the difference? Those on the Word side stress, earnestly contending for the faith, one delivered, once delivered to the saints, expository teaching, sound theology, even rediscovering the doctrines of the Reformation like justification by faith and sovereignty of God, etc. You may say, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that emphasis? Absolutely nothing. And then on the other side, the spirit side, they stress getting back to the book of Acts, signs, wonders, miracles, and the gifts of the spirit. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that emphasis? Absolutely nothing. The problem is many people try and exclude the two of them. You see, you cannot have the word without the spirit. You cannot have the spirit without the word. And so... We as Pentecostals, we have an experiential Christianity, but if we ignore the proper teachings of the Word of God, we get ourselves in trouble. Smith Wigglesworth, and he was from 1859 to 1947, was known as the Apostle of Faith, 
moved in mighty signs and wonders and even raised people from the dead, he said it this way. When the Word and the Spirit come together, there will be the biggest movement of the Holy Spirit that the nation and indeed the world has ever seen. It will, be, it will mark the beginning of a revival that will eclipse anything that has ever been witnessed. And so that's my viewpoint. When the Word and the Spirit come together, we will see revival. And God is going to be doing that. But this coming outpouring of the Spirit of God, and I believe it will come, will dry up if people run off to the manifestations and try and profit out of this for themselves. Unfortunately, over the years, we've seen this over and over again, and just as quickly as the Spirit became evident in His working, just as quickly did he leave because people focused on the manifestation instead of God. Jonathan Edwards, the great preacher from yesteryear, said this, when the church is revived, so is the devil. My many years of ministry, I've seen the worst excesses in the charismatic and the Pentecostal movement, uh, false prophecies, fake healing, Flesh, fleshly speaking in tongues, peeping, people falling over when the only thing that is changed is now their hair is dirty because of the carpet. Furthermore, the folk who are self-appointed apostles and prophets or even worse, appointed by a so-called apostle just strikes me as phony and I've seen unfortunately as we've traveled around the world We've seen the havoc in many, many countries because of this. When I read of Paul's progress, how he described himself, he starts out by describing himself as the chief among the apostles. But you go on and look at his later writings, and he calls himself the least of all of these. And that's who we are. We're the least of all, but we have the privilege of testifying to God's glory and His goodness. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and that He's active today as He has ever been. And we have experienced and seen the remarkable power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But then, I also believe in the infallible inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. And for me, there is no volume two. There is no yearbook. This is it. This is the canon of Scripture that you and I must base our lives on. I cannot see how some would twist the text to prove that the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit were limited to the early days of the church. And having said this, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, the holy fire from above and the strange fire that comes from the flesh. That word holy should give us a clue to what we're talking about. We're talking about a holy God and a holy spirit. Anything less than holy is a poor imitation of the real thing, and it will fail to deliver and set free and heal and convict. You see, Saint Edmund will always raise up a counterfeit to imitate sincere seekers or to intimidate sincere seekers of God, to put them off so that they will turn in the opposite direction. Strange fire almost always shows up in any true revival or movement raised up by God. If you have a heart for God, Satan is unhappy with you. Gabby spoke about it, Earl spoke about it this morning. The closer you get to God, the more resistance from the enemy. He will still work over time to quell the hunger that you have, and he will never stop. Paul said, of Satan, we are not ignorant of his devices or designs, but more importantly than discerning the counterfeit, it is important for us to recognize the genuine presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, when I looked this morning or was listening this morning, not only with my head but with my heart, as Earl was ministering to us, that was the Holy Spirit speaking through him for you and me. 
It might have been for one person in the sanctuary. It might have been for a multitude watching online. But God used Earl this morning to speak to us by his spirit. And we need to be attentive. You see, we don't come for the music. We come to worship him and allow him to minister to us. Jesus said that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. Not maybe, not occasionally, but will be filled. And so I invite you to walk on a journey that is designed to satisfy your appetite for sound teaching and a greater measure of the Holy Spirit. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 and 2 says, Now the Spirit expressly says, expressly, in other words, He's emphasizing this, that in later times, some will depart from the, the, the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons through the insincerity of liars whose conscience has been seared. And then 2 Timothy 3, sorry, 4 verse 3 to 5. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but will have itching ears, and they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. What is he saying, do your work an evangelist? He's not saying go down a Pike Place market with the biggest Bible you can find and stand on the street corner and, and shout out to everybody. If that's what God wants you to do, you better do it. But when he's talking about doing a work of evangelist, we live by the Spirit and we allow God to use us to tell others about it. That's what he's talking about here. And so... Jonathan Edwards said that the one thing Satan cannot produce in us is a love for the glory of God. I don't know about you, but I hunger and seek after the glory of God, not only for myself, but you as well. I want to see God manifest in this place that people will be changed by his spirit. I remember many, many years ago, I think I've told the story once or twice before, when I was in the Philippines doing a, a leadership seminar, there were about 2,000 leaders that had gathered for a whole week. We'd housed them in a, in a school, and we fed them three meals a day, plus coffee and tea, various times of the day. And we ministered from morning to evening. And the very first morning I walked into that sanctuary, there must have been a couple of hundred, if not more, leaders who had been praying since five o'clock in the morning, and the floorboards of that very simple school hall were stained with the tears of these men and women who were seeking God. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had something like that here? We had such a powerful week. The very next morning, guess who was up front with them early in the morning? Because I felt so convicted that these men and women from some of the poorest places in the Philippines had come. Some had traveled for, for days to get to us, caught boats and whatever. They came, and at 5 o'clock the very first morning, there they were, praying and believing God, that God would not only touch them, but touch their nation. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people, not the people who don't, believe in Christ, but my people have been destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And then that scripture goes on and it says, because they have rejected that knowledge. In other words, Christians decided that they, there was a limitation to the amount or to what they are going to believe. I know it might seem like I'm beating an old drum, but here goes anyway. If you know your way around the Word of God and you are actively praying and pursuing the Lord, then it is highly unlikely, if not impossible, for you to be deceived. Bible, the devil doesn't want you to read your Bible, much less spend time, uh, spend a lot of time reading the Bible. 
He wants you to pick up your Bible in the morning, go like this. Huh, what am I going to read this morning? Oh, he has this verse, Psalm 22, verse 4. You are holy, enthroned on praises of Israel. Off we go for the day. No, no, I beg of you, spend time with him. Get to know him. Fall in love. If you've been a Christian for a long time, fall in love with Jesus all over again. Open your heart this morning and just say, Lord, come. Here I am. Show yourself to me. Secondly, you know, you know some, someone's ways when you spend time with them. You show your esteem of that person by how much you give, how much time you give them. So I come directly to the point. How much are you praying? How much are you spending, how much time are you spending with the Lord? There's so many amazing resources. You know, besides Rooted, which is a 10-week program, there's so many other amazing resources out there that you can look up online and you can spend time with God by having these teachers lead you and guide you. William Cowper said this, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint on his knees. And so let me gently urge you, spend time with your Lord, your Savior. Millions of people in our culture make decisions for Christ, but you know, there's a dreadful attrition rate. Many claim to be born again, but the evidence, the evidence for mature Christian discipleship is slim. In our culture, anything can be sold if it's packaged correctly, but when it loses its novelty, it goes on the garbage heap. Eugene Peterson said this, religion in our time has been captured by the tourist mentality. Religion is understood as a visit to an attractive site to be made when we have adequate leisure. For some, it is a weekly jaunt to church. For others, occasional visits to special services. We go to see, quote unquote, a new personality, to hear a new truth, to get a new experience, end of quote, because we are all looking for the silver bullet. We will try anything until something else comes along. Unfortunately, we have been inundated with strange teachings. And you know, it always starts with our view of God. Numbers 3, verse 2 to 4, it says this, they are the names of the sons of Aaron. He was the high priest. Nadab, the firstborn, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the anointed priests. They were priests as well, who he ordained to serve as priests. But Nahab and Abihu died before the Lord when they offered unworthy or strange fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. The single but never to be forgotten occasion of strange fires described in these verses. The word strange there means unauthorized, foreign, or profane. You see, God not only rejected their sacrifice, he found it so offensive that he consumed these two men. But there is no reward for uncommanded work. Doing what God commands pleases him. 1 Samuel 15, 22. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of, the fat of rams. He demands our holiness, folks. A defective view of God has resulted in dangerous teachings, as I've said. There is a lot of strange fire out there that has crept into the church. And let me just highlight a few of them. Number one, it's what I call hypergrace. They say that since Jesus has dealt with our sins on the cross, there's no need to confess sin. 
God is not some, but you know, God is not some celestial grandfather who smiles benevolently on us despite what we do. Yes, there is forgiveness at the cross, but we cannot keep doing our own thing and expect God to bless us and pour his blessings out upon us. The second one is, it is open theism. This view brings God down to the level of man, and I can command God to do anything, and I can interpret the word of God like I want to. The third one, and this is sometimes a part of the health, wealth, and prosperity teachings. It's absolutely true that God promises to bless the person who tithes. It is absolutely true that the word of God promises us health and vitality and etc. But beware of those who pitch this point of view mainly to advance their own ministries. And I previously dealt with this topic and so I'm not going to go on. Number four, some leaders go as far as to claim that their words of knowledge are superior to Holy Scripture. I'm not even going to comment on that, but you know what there. You see, God judged that original strange fire instantly. God still speaks to us, and we must be open to hearing his voice. But everything that is said, I want to implore you, go back to the word of God. Amen. If somebody prophesies over you, go back to the word of God to see if it lines up with the word of God. Even what Earl says when he's ministering to us, or what I say on a Sunday morning, why do you think I give you the outlines? Because I want you to go back to the word of God to check it out. And if I am wrong, if I've said something, whether advert you know, on purpose or inadvertently, come and talk to me, okay? Because you know what? You can touch me. I'm fallible man. Adam is only skin deep for me too. And so uphold, defend, and stand for the truth of Scripture. It would be a great pity and a victory for Satan if you allow Strange teaching to disillusion you. Charles Spurgeon said this, I looked to Christ and the dove flew in. What's he talking about? The Holy Spirit. And then he goes on. But when I looked to the dove, he disappeared. Huh. We must remember that in the Old Testament, that it was not only the Ten Commandments that matter. God wrote the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial laws. In the incident we spoke about earlier with Aaron's sons, they were also priests, and they violated the ceremonial laws. You see, the Bible is all important. We can't slice and dice it like we want to. And I'm reminded of the story of Jefferson, President Jefferson. He took his Bible, and he took a razor blade, and he cut out. Portions of the New Testament where it spoke about miracles, etc. He repasted the passages of the Gospels that he considered authentic, morally true, and discarded the rest. In other words, gone was a virgin birth, divine healing, deliverance, and resurrection from the dead, all of which the chief executive dismissed as superstitious fanaticism, and fabrications. In Jefferson's view, this revision represented a faithful record of Christ's moral code minus the miracles, and he dismissed everything else. They dismissed that as myth-making. As I previously said, unfortunately, there are those who would preach the incomplete gospel. The apostle said, Apostle Paul said, in the last days, some would abandon their faith and follow deceiving spirits. Indeed, 2 Timothy 4.3 says a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. So a personal relationship with God is essential to see God's favor. Psalm 103 and verse 7, and I'll close in a few moments. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the, the sons of Israel. And I'm struck by this. Let me read that scripture and just stop for a moment for you to think. He made known his ways to Moses, 
and his acts to the uh, sons of Israel. What happened? Moses went up to the mountain to meet with God personally. Children of Israel were at the bottom of the mountain in fear. Moses drew closer to the Lord while the people drew back. Why does the presence of the Lord cause some to draw back and shrink back? Key difference is that the people of Israel knew about God, but Moses had a relationship with God. Moses knew his nature and character and was not afraid of his presence. People only knew what God did through someone else, but they did not know God. I want you to have such a relationship with God that you will draw closer to him instead of shrinking back and wanting somebody else to tell you about God. You know, it is an amazing lesson for us today. Hebrews 13, 8, you see it on the wall as you walk in. In the wall over there, it's embossed there. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. We as Pentecostals love that verse because it proves that he is the same. But let me encourage you, whenever you read scripture, never take a scripture out of context because listen to Hebrews uh, 13 and verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Verse 9, now listen to this. Do not be carried away by all kinds, by all kinds of strange teaching. Hmm. Do you see how reading in context makes the difference? So, how is solid teaching to be maintained? Firstly, those of us who lead, because you know, James says we're going to be held doubly accountable. Those of us who lead must teach the truth as it's found in Scripture only. The Word of God doesn't change, but there's more. We need to have what I call a God-centered worship. By that I mean it's not what is in it for me. In this what is in it for me generation of music has so much infiltrated our worship today. It is my prayer that God will continue to bless and guide our worship team as they lead us in God-honoring worship. And as you participate in that. Do you know while you're standing there worshiping God, I want you to listen by your spirit I want you to listen inside you to what he's saying to you. It might not even be in relation to the particular song that they're singing, but God can drop something in your spirit right there when you are worshiping him, when you've forgotten about the world out there and you focus in on him. It could be that as you're worshiping him, he says to you, I want you to go home and call your mother. I want you to go and reconcile with that person that you've been in contention with. I don't know what it is. It might be that right here in the service, God says to you, after the service, or even as we're closing the service, you get up and go and pray for that man back there or that precious woman back there. Whatever it is, we've come to minister to him but at the same time to minister to each other because we are the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen? Amen. God bless you. We love you. Why don't I put that one up for fun? <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. God bless you. We love you so much. And we're thankful for you. We're thankful for our visitors who have come here this morning. We do appreciate you being with us. If you have any questions about our church, about me, about Gabby, about anybody, please feel free to just get hold of us. And so, Earl, would you lead us, my friend?
I always marvel at the stories I read about Spurgeon. He was in a 10,000-seater auditorium, the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and they didn't use any kind of uh, devices like this stupid thing over here. Of course, they designed the building so that the, the, his voice would carry right through that whole sanctuary. I just think one day we should design a building and we don't need any of this stuff here. We just come to be with Jesus. God bless you.